Thank you everybody joining us for today um, for our 10th virtual shadowing session with Free Health Shadowing. Today we are honored to be hosting Anthony Manchano, who is currently a PA working in family medicine in Sacramento. Welcome, Anthony. Hello, hello. So are we gonna list? Uh, I, I should just give a quick introduction to myself. So my name is Tony. You guys can call me Tony. I am a practicing family medicine and street medicine PA out of Sacramento, California. Um, I trained out of Keck uh, School of Medicine in, at USC, and I am, I'm privileged to be here with you guys. So um, did you want to start, Mina or Nina? Do you want to start? Let's just jump into it. Let's just go straight into it. It's all you. Yeah. Do it, dude. Let's do it. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen, and then ideally, let's do this, and you guys can see all my all the craziness that goes, that is my life. Okay. Okay. Beautiful. All right. So I see people coming in. So, um, so like I said, my name is uh, Anthony. You guys can call me Tony. I, I'm a family medicine and street medicine PA. Um, I practice out of uh, Sacramento. And um, I also serve as the executive director of Sacramento Street Medicine, which is an initiative that we started uh, last summer prior to COVID. Um, and we have a bunch of different, uh, we've pretty much blown up, I think, since COVID. But now we have eight different uh, street outreach teams that go into seven or eight different encampments throughout Sacramento. Um, and kind of like all the moving parts, we have medical students, PA students, doctors, PAs, nurses, what have you. Um, so that's been that's been pretty incredible. But anyway, so uh, I was watching, like I was telling Nina, I was watching some of the, the previous uh, shadowing sessions that you guys had. And, and it was like going through a lot of the person's like history and all the things that um, that the person has done and the, the specifics of their of their research and all of those things. Um, I'm going to like switch it up a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, like give some background as to what I've done um, relatively quickly. And then we'll go into um, tips and pointers for you that are looking to go into health, into medicine, whether it's medical school or PA school or nursing school, what have you. Um, I've been mentoring students guys for 10 plus years. I look young, but I've been doing this for quite some time. But um, so I wanted to do that. And then um, because I do practice family medicine and street medicine, I wanted to go through some cases. Um, I've done this uh, virtual shadowing thing for you know a few times over the past few months because of COVID. So I wanted to hopefully go through some cases with you guys. Um, these are patients that I've seen personally and um, are pretty personal stories for me. So anyway, okay. All right, so let's see if we can do this to work. Yes, okay, any disclosures? So all my opinions are my own and in no way represent your employer. So my employer, I should say, um, I work for Communicare. Um, obviously I, I, I do speak on behalf of Sacramento Street Medicine um, and our, our community here. I sit on many boards here in Sacramento. Um, and so uh, I do have knowledge in terms of like what's happening in the, in the community here in Sacramento um, and in, in the Northern California uh, area. Um, I do own a program for a student success. Like I said, I've been mentoring students for 10 plus years. It was just last year that we started um, working with students to provide a platform for students that, that is otherwise untapped and, and unknown for students, for students that have to go into post back and do all, spend all this money and time and effort um, to not set themselves up to be successful at the next step, um, to make sure that you get to go wherever you want to go, where, whether it's you know the medical school that you've always dreamed of or the PA school or whatever. Um, so I do have that, but I'm not trying to sell anybody. So that's not the, that's not the purpose of this, of this talk. So next one, uh, let's see. Okay. So we're just going to, I'm just going to say like where I come from. So I, um, went to Cal State University of San Bernardino. Many people don't even know where that is. It's in Southern California. It's about 45 minutes out of Los Angeles. I played soccer there for four years. Um, and while I was there, like I, I, um, really grew like as a student I, I like I said I played soccer the first three four years and then I I was like bouncing around majors I was always I was always pretty good at school in terms of like 
um, just like studying and, and, and really getting down information. And then eventually I, I stumbled upon medicine and then I, I went to the uh, UC Davis pre-medical and pre-health conference um, as a senior-ish. It was like, I think it was beginning of my senior year. Uh, and then like, I was like, hey, well, why don't we, you know, Cal State doesn't have anything like that in San Bernardino. So why don't we host something like that? So my brother and I, I have a twin brother who also went to USC and he's a, he's a practicing PA as well um, in critical care. Uh, we were like, well, why don't we like host a conference like this? And so we started it literally from a piece of paper and it pretty much, and it blew up. Uh, and uh, the, 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 um, the office of the president sponsored it for $15,000 on a rolling basis. So now it's in its eighth year. I spoke at it in January. I'll probably speak at it um, this coming January virtually. But uh, in any case, this is like just a part of it. This is like a health resource fair in between workshops and all this kind of stuff. Um, it was pretty awesome. I got to, I got to learn and know a lot of the people, uh, that are like making these decisions, the deans of admissions at like UCLA school of medicine, UCI school of medicine, UCR, UC Davis, UC San Diego, like, um, USC, a bunch of, a bunch of, uh, amazing, amazing people. And got a lot of, a lot of good networks here. Um, from here I was, I was, I, I say recruited, but like everything's a network for me. Um, uh, Congressman Raul Ruiz, uh, at, the, at the time was Dr. Ro Ruiz, the first Mexican American to get three advanced degrees from Harvard, asked both my brother and I to go serve with him in Congress because he had won in DC. So my brother and I went to Washington DC. We served there for about six months as congressional interns in 2013, working on the Affordable Care Act. Um, that was pretty incredible. I stayed in this building over here. You know, they, they do all the legislation here, but, uh, Around the around the Capitol are all the actual Senate and House um, buildings, and so we did our we did our work there. I basically had lunch here every day. It was pretty cool. Uh, and then I came back, and I because I gathered this like semi policy uh, experience, I came back. I finished my degree at Cal State, and then I uh, moved to Sacramento, and I started working at the California State Capitol, where I worked on covering people with. Uh, uh, actually expressing the voices of people that were being um, taken advantage of in Medi-Cal, Medicare, Cover California, all of these things and speaking and lobbying at the, at the Capitol was pretty amazing. Um, and fortunately for me, uh, the work that I was doing there, which was a paid internship, um, was featured on the front page of the LA Times. And so that was, that was pretty like uh, special to me. At the same time, like I was, I was working at the cap, I was working at the Capitol nine to five and then I was working on the ambulance six to like midnight every every day, and then Saturdays I'd work at twelve. So it was like crazy. It was crazy hours, but it was it was pretty. It was it was pretty cool to say the least. Okay, then I went on. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, get a full ride scholarship to to USC as an NHSC scholar. Um, that is something I think that anybody that's looking into going to primary care, even pedi so pediatrics, primary care, or, uh, family medicine. Uh, ob and Psych, any of those qualify for primary care. NHSC is a phenomenal, phenomenal opportunity for any of those looking to have their schooling paid for. Um, the NHSC scholarship itself um, is a very uh, uh, tough scholarship to get, but there are also loan or payment programs through NHSC after you graduate um, that a lot of my colleagues are, are, um, that are a part of. I was fortunate enough to get the actual scholarship and so my tuition was paid for, I believe it was like a $280,000 scholarship with, with stipends. And it, it allowed me, I, when I moved up to Sacramento, I actually had my daughter, which is like my why. Um, and because I got that scholarship, I was able to go to USC in Los Angeles and fly up to Sacramento every other week throughout PA school, which was for me was three years, um, was pretty incredible. Anyway, this is my brother. I'm the ha more handsome looking one, uh, but, and taller, I'm just, I'm just saying. But we both graduated from USC. We, uh, my brother's in critical care, practicing street medicine now with uh, the USC street medicine team. Um, and I obviously went up to Sacramento to practice family medicine um, and started my own, my own gig at Sacramento Street Medicine. Uh, last year, at the end of last year, I was fortunate enough um, through my work in the community here in Sacramento and in, and in Southern California 
and my work with students uh, that I've been doing for like many, many years, guys. Um, I, my, both my brother and I were nominated for man of the year of San Bernardino County, which is the second biggest county in the country. Uh, so I was really, I was super, super fortunate. And, and I think my brother and I were the youngest people nominated because everybody else was like so accomplished. And, and it was just, it was, a, it was a humbling experience for sure. Um, so anyway, uh, this was toward the end of last year. And then I found it, I came back up here to Sacramento. I, I founded Sacramento Street Medicine um, uh, through the guidance of Brett Feldman and Corinne Feldman, who I actually have a meeting with here today. Um, who are the directors of the USC Street Medicine team. They um, had known I was going up to Sacramento. We had done work in Skid Row uh, in Los Angeles through our, through our you know, schooling and training at USC. And so I founded Sacramento Street Medicine um, just with undergrads, like literally all UC Davis, uh, Cal State Sacramento undergrads. And we, you know, we, uh, I gathered like 80 students to do needs assessments um, all throughout Sacramento to find out the needs of the unhoused. Um, and then um, the, like, based off that, we came up with a, you know, a strategy, a plan um, to, to carry out these things. And then just recently, there was another group that formed among med medical students at UC Davis in California North State, which is a new medical school here in Northern California, um, that wanted to do work in the home uh, among the unhoused. And so we combined forces and now Sacramento Street Medicine has grown significantly and um, Sutter Health has reached out to us, Dignity Health has reached out to us and, and UC Davis Health um, has reached out to us to, um, to partner and fund our program to reduce uh, rehospitalization rates, reduce ER um, visits and so on and so forth and increase um, primary care establishment. So um, that's been phenomenal. I also founded Brainbox, which is a, a program for, uh, for students to be successful both academically and professionally. Um, this, is, this is just something that, I, that, that both my brother and I and mentoring students for over 10 plus years, we noticed like students just don't have the resources outside of you know, like tutors and, and maybe some resources that you're afforded through your career center or what have you, but there's no like real platform that teaches students how to be successful. A lot of students will ask, will ask my, both my brother and I is like, how do you do like all that you do? Like if, if you look at my schedule, it's pretty crazy. And the things that I'm, that I'm always involved in and trying to do these things. And a lot of it comes down to just uh, both soft skills, hard skills. Um, and then obviously you want to make sure that you're getting the grades. Do you package your resume, right? Do you have the right application? You have like a, a stellar application. Who are, who are you? Who, who are you as a person? Um, all of that like falters. And then like, you know, we get these students in their senior, super senior post-grad years. And like, we're building from like, you know, from zero, you know? And we were like, man, we, this needs to be uh, a thing, a resource for students. And so we, we, built the we built the platform. Now there's hundreds of students that are, that are within Brainbox and, and, and thriving. Like we just have so many, so many, so many success stories. It's just, it's just pretty amazing. So um, there's that. I, so what do I do now? This, this here are some two PA students that I worked with that I uh, brought out to my, uh, to one of the encampments called the snake pit here in Sacramento. This over here, oh, this is me, but this over here is my daughter. She comes out with me every, a few times uh, to do outreach so long as, you know, things are safe and, and things are going well. She loves it. Honestly, she loves giving back and it's a great like um, lesson. Uh, you can see here, this, you know, just kind of depicts like where we go. Street medicine is about like going to the people and meeting them where they're at, you know, understanding um, that. Uh, and that's not just like physically, right? Physically, we're going like along the rivers, we're going under bridges, we're going over over bridges, we're going wherever, we're going in the, in the woods and whatever. Um, but also like emotionally and, and, and physically, like uh, the majority, I tell my students all the time that Street medicine, the majority of street medicine is not medicine. It's like the psychosocial aspect of like building a relationship, building trust. Can they, can you, can you offer like equal respect to one another? Are you, are you perform, are you forming some type of power dynamic between you and the person? Or are you, are you leveling the, the, the playing ground so that you guys are um, equals in, in care? 
Um, obviously you have prescribing power or you have the ability to take care of somebody's wound or whatever, but like, if you don't have the trust and you don't have the, the relationship, it doesn't really matter what you can do. So anyway, um, there's that. I also practice in clinic. This is me. Uh, I am a Trojan. So I'm like hardcore, hardcore Trojan. Doesn't mean I'm like anti UCLA. I have, we have a lot of UCLA students within BrainBox. Um, I think we have like five now five students within BrainBox on scholarship at UCLA Medical School of Medicine, um, which is incredible. Anyway, so uh, I practice family medicine at CommuniCare. Uh, I just put down here some of the things like, why did I choose family medicine? And you guys can ask me these questions. We're gonna go through this and then we'll go through some tips for you guys. Um, I'm gonna go through some cases um, that I have, two cases that I've gone through. Um, and then we can have some questions and I'm going to be, try to be mindful of time so we can make sure we get questions. Cause I know, uh, I host a lot of these like zooms and I, I tend to just like continually talk if nobody's jumping in and I want to make sure that you guys get your questions answered. Um, family medicine, you know, you have long-term relationships, you have very variability in patient cases. You can be in, you can be a neurologist in one room and then the dermatologist in another room. And then, you know, the the urologist in the other room and then you're just like the general practitioner in another room so the variability in, in patient cases is is absolutely incredible uh, flexibility in practice like um i guess that kind of goes in with patient cases uh what i would is what i would say but also like in, in schedule like different clinics operate differently i have you know i work a pretty heavy schedule monday tuesday and then wednesday thursday friday i have the afternoons off um I generally have the afternoons off. So that was beautiful. Street medicine at Sacramento Street Medicine, I do this. It's unpredictable. There's a community effort. We just did a retreat, which was like so touching. So many people came out and like supported and like gave their testimony. And oh my God, it was just, it was just so amazing to see so many people on the same page to address an issue within Sacramento because it's just getting worse. And with the pandemic, it, it seems like it's, it's obviously um, only gonna get worse relationships. I have so many amazing relationships with my people living outside. Um, there are times where I just go and I, I play chess with my, with my buddy Eddie and, or play um, checkers with my buddy Joseph or have coffee or like, you know, bring donuts or whatever. Um, and it's just like these relationships that you'll just never, um, you just never understand until you go out there. And some of the things that you see and, and experience out, outside just by giving, um, absolutely incredible. The beautiful thing about street medicine is that there are no hierarchies. We have no, like, doesn't matter how, what letters are behind your name. I treat any one, of my, any one of our volunteers, any one of our students, any one of our providers the same. We are all at the same table. In fact, um, we, are at the, we are at the mercy and, and service of our patients. So I, I stress on doing this uh, servant's pose if you look at this picture on the bottom left, this is what the servant's pose is. And the idea is that you're, you know, in medicine, they always say like, don't, like when you walk into the room, like don't, don't walk and like stand up and, and stand over the patient if they're, if they're sitting down, right? Um, you want to get eye level, right? But Brett Feldman, who is the director of, of, of uh, USC street medicine team in Skid Row, um, would always, would always uh, emphasize that at, you should always be below the patient. And the idea is that you're, you're at the feet of the patient. You're at the service of the patient. And so what would happen is, you know, this is me. And if I have my team there, uh, I do what Brett would do. Brett would like kneel down and he'd look at the rest of our team and like everybody should be kneeling down because everybody's below the patient. Um, and there's some power. There's like, you get rid of the power dynamic. You put, the, you put essentially the care in the patient's uh, hands. Okay. Woo. That was all me but so i want to talk about uh you guys now like i said i've been doing this for uh, for quite some time with students and um there are always like pillars that's that every student has right like these are you know i'm sure there are many questions like hey is my gpa okay hey do i have enough volunteer work hey do, is this leadership okay hey do i have enough shadowing uh, shadow enough shadowing hours um, am I doing enough research or what type of research or, you know, what type of work experience like is going to qualify me for the, the patient care experience for PA school or what type of work experience looks good for medical school or, you know, the, the, the 
the answer is that everything is a box. And I used, I sat, I sat on the admissions committee at, um, at USC and working with um, the students that were, that were going to be getting in prospective students and interviewing them. And I can tell you that like all of these right here, these are pillars, right? This is what, this is what I'm saying. These are pillars. These are all boxes that you need to check, right? You need to have the grades. You need to have the volunteer work. You need to have the leadership experience. You need to have the shadowing experience. You need to have the research. You need to have the work experience, depending if you're going to, you know, PA school or medical school or nursing school, you know, work experience isn't, isn't as important for medical school, though I, though I, though I recommend it because you should know what you're getting into before you even get into medicine. Um, and then standardized testing, right? Like MCAT, P, PACAT, GRE, whatever. Um, the, but the idea is that all of these is the, is, are the things that everybody's gonna have, right? Everybody's gonna have, you can imagine that everybody that gets an interview is gonna have good grades. Anybody that's gonna get separated from the pile is gonna have a substantial amount of volunteer work. They're gonna have good leadership experience. They're gonna have, you know, shadowing experience. They're gonna have all these things. Um, and I'm gonna just gonna kind of go through, through these um, real quick before we go on to the next slide. But you have to also think in mind, like keep in mind, like what, what's gonna make you stand out? These are all pillars that everybody else is gonna have on the same application. So what, what is gonna separate your application? What's gonna separate you as a student to get the opportunity to interview, right? Um, for grades, like the grades are pretty, pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory, right? I generally say above 3.5. And depending on the school that you want to get into for volunteer work, I say 10 experiences, 10 different volunteer experiences. I hope people are taking notes, 10 different volunteer experiences. Um, every like for over four years, 10, 10 different experiences is pretty, is pretty minimal, but you need 10, at least 10 leadership experience. I say five, this is through like, you know, student clubs, you look up the, the student clubs on your campus or within the state, or within the region or with, you know, nationally, you can come up with five clubs like this. So five leadership experiences, um, and through that is officership and all this kind of stuff, at least five. Um, shadowing experience, you know, you wanna make sure that you, you wanna do like what it is that you're, you know, spending so much time and money and effort on to make sure you're doing the shadowing experience. For my people going to PA school, it's at least 30 to 40 hours, um, but don't let, like I would, I would shadow multiple specialties, even if you're trying to go to medical school or nursing school, like do multiple specialties. Don't let one physician or PA or nurse or who, what have you determine like how you, how you view a profession or how you view, view a field, because there are great, there are great docs. There are bad docs. There are great PAs. There are terrible PAs. There are great nurses and there are bad nurses and all the specialties in between NP, what have you. Um, so don't let your shadowing experience determine because I promise you, like, if you shadow me, you'd have a freaking blast and you'd think like, I want to go to PA and I want to be practicing family medicine and I want to do street medicine. I want to do what Tony does, but, but then like go shadow somebody else and you, maybe you shadow a physician in a, in the ER room in the ER and you're like, Holy, sh this is, this is super badass and I want to do this. And then you can have that debate with yourself as to like, after you, after you've already educated yourself you can, you can kind of parse through those things. Um, but you need, you need that experience. Research experience, I mean, super simple to get the research experience, guys. Um, literally ask any of your, of your professors. They're mandated to, do, to contribute to their field of work. Um, that's just like, that's just the nature of the beast. They just have to, they have to do it. You offer to do some of the most like ridiculous things like data entry and it takes, it takes like no, um, real skill to do it, but it, it's good because you understand you have to know the research and you understand that you're getting the experience. You have to start somewhere. Um, work experience, we can have that discussion and the questions um, and standardized testing. Again, we can have that, that discussion in the, in the question, question uh, section if those that um, have questions about those. All right, but you have these pillars and so what's gonna make you stand out? And so, I always say the X factor. I never watched this show, but I just, I, I heard it's good. Anyway, uh, I say internships and I don't just mean internships like 
any internships. I, I generally tend to, to tell students to go across the country. There are internships all over the country, guys. Now, I, it's, it's a little tough with COVID and, and things like that, but I do know many of my students, many of our students at Framework like said have gotten internships and are going across the country, you know, in the midst of COVID, as long as they're taking the precautions and, and so on and so forth. Um, a great internship is Health Career Connections. I, I advise everybody to write this down and I advise everybody to look at this very, very soon because their, their selection process is very, um, very extensive and, but it's one of the best internships I had ever been a part of. Um, I have been, uh, I've done six internships and this was probably the best one, Health Career, health career Connections. Um, and their applications open in December. They do like two rounds of interview. They select, they, they place students at some of the best, inst best institutions, best companies and things um, throughout the country. And it's basically uh, geared toward public health, which is good because it makes you a more holistic applicant going into whatever school that you're trying to go into, regardless of what that, what that is. Um, and, it, and, it, and it'll help you. Um, let's see. Yes. And so, uh, what, I mean, why do I say across the country? I generally say across the country because like, it's going to force you to, to grow as a person. The, I tell this to students all the time is like, when we're working on your resume, when we're working on all these things and adding this and adding that it's not the experiences. It's not the experiences that, that we're trying to go after. It's like who you become in spite of those, like on the way and through those experiences, like, are you becoming more resilient? Because you, you know, when I went, when I was in Washington, DC, I had no policy experience. I lived in Falls Church, Virginia with my brother, actually. Um, I had no idea. I, I had never taken like a Metro or anything like that. We literally walked, we had to get up at 4 a.m., 4, like 10, 4, 15 a.m. to walk a mile and a half to the Metro, to get on this Metro, the orange line, the Metro, which is like stacked, like packed, like sardines with business casual people and everybody's sweating and it's like terrible. We take that train an hour to the, to the, to the Capitol, walk another like half a mile or mile to the, to the thing. And then you're ready to work by like 7 a.m. And you work seven to five and you do the same thing over. And so you can imagine like, that's not even talking about like the actual work that we did, you know? So resilience, teamwork, like grit, all those things come with forcing yourself to be put in a situation like that. Um, community, community initiatives, like these are the things that are going to make you stand out, guys. Like you have to think about what is it that people aren't doing? And it's things like this, community initiatives, conducting your own research, find out like pressing things in your community and you can literally do a needs assessment. You can get some friends, you can get some students together, you can do a needs assessment. You can find out if, if that in fact is the actual need. And then two, what can you do about it? For us, it was the, it was the unhoused population because it grew by 2000 people. And then now, and then now it's grown by 6,000. So when I got here in Sacramento, it was 3,500. Now it's a, it's a 11,000, 11,700. Um, so there's a, there's a pressing need. And so we are working with, you know, to provide care, establish that relationship, gain the trust of our people, take care of their health, and then get them in a stable enough uh, mentally and health in, in, within their health, optimize their health so that they can, they can get into housing. And we have, you know, we're invited to the table to speak on behalf of our patients when it comes to, uh, to housing in Sacramento, um, which is incredible. It's incredible. So, um, Community initiatives, you can literally, again, find something that's, that's going on in your community, call it something, call your initiative something. Originally, Sacramento Street Medicine was literally called, I, I saw an email because I, I just got, I was contacted by Sac State, Sacramento State uh, of this email thread that I had like last year. It was like Sacramento Homeless Initiative. That's what it was called. And then eventually it turned into Sacramento Street Medicine. Because originally it was just a, it was just an initiative, um, and you can do that. Any student can do that. I I I tell students all the time. It's like, don't don't use the don't cop out and say you're just a student because you're a, you're a human. You're an individual with skills, 
and skills to obtain, skills to learn, because granted, when you do these, these initiatives and you do these conducting your own research and doing all these things, you raise awareness for a meaningful cause, you're gonna, you're gonna trip up, you're gonna fail, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna do all those things, but you're going to learn so much in the process. I promise you, the person that you become is worth the journey. Like, I can't tell you how many times, like with Sac within Sacramento Street Medicine, I like just dropped the ball or I just made the mistake or I just didn't, I didn't do it right. But now I have a call today with UC Davis Health to talk about how we're going to partner, you know, and it's crazy. We just stay consistent. You stay, keep, you, you keep at it, you keep at it. Um, and we just keep going. Um, and the same with you with regard to, um, you know, doing these community initiatives, doing the research, um, and then you can, you can raise awareness of a meaningful cause. Um, the whole thing with, um, uh, is it Armenia, all these, like, there's so many things that you can get behind and, and show passion, but ultimately, like, I also tell students is like, lean into your passion. Like, what is, what is it outside of medicine that, that you're passionate about? Like, before you found medicine, what were you passionate about? Maybe while you found medicine, what else are you passionate about? Because those things are going to make you stand out. And so this is what I, again, you, the thought process should always be like, what is going to make me stand out? Because there are thousands of people applying for the same spot that you're applying to. There are thousands, thousands of people. Okay. The acceptance rate at USC for, uh, for where I went to school was 2%, literally 2%, which is insane. Okay. So I tell this student to students, uh, write this down, please, for the love of God, write this down. It's called the 70, I call it the 70, 30 rule. And now regardless of where you're at in, let's, let's just, let's just like do a thought experiment for your resume. Um, you're in leadership, memberships, uh, volunteer experience, research, honors and awards, whatever, whatever it is. 70% of that section should be towards your field of interest. You know, you're volunteering at the, un, you know, you're volunteering at the clinic, you're volunteering at the hospital, you're volunteering this, you're doing this, and it's all kind of tied into medicine or health, right? It could be pre-health, could be like something related to health, right? Because this is pre-health shadowing. 70% of that is health, but 30% of that should be like, what is it that like, again what are your passions like what do you like and if you don't have passions because i I've, I've come up this with with students like they're seniors and they're ready to apply to school and it's like you ask them what they're passionate about outside of medicine which they don't really know like i guess you're passionate about it, but you don't really know about it too much you're kind of pursuing it uh they don't have any passions there's no passions so i'm like okay well, what do you like to do do you like to read? Do you like to play piano? Do you like to, do you like to write? Do you like to draw? Do you like to do all these things? And I'm like, yeah, lean into that. Like put that down, like maybe find a club that, that that's a reading club or a piano, like a guitar club. Uh, you love, you know, if you're, if you're um, like, if you're deep in your religion, like do that, like pick a few so that, so that again, we talked about those pillars, like the 70% are those pillars. Like those are the things that everybody's going to have every student every student will have those pillars but what is it that's going to make you stand out is like uh i was reading an application uh the other day uh usc this is applying to usc and uh she she wrote she wrote children's books she's from the philippines she wrote children she loves to write and she writes children's books she wrote children's books then would go to the philippines twice a year and bring all the books that she read, that she wrote, um, make copies and bring them back to the Philippines, leaving at the library there and read them to the kids in the, in the neighborhood because they're, they're poor health, they're poor literacy. They have poor literacy within that neighborhood. And I'm like, holy hell, dude, like I could care less what you did in the, in the hospital. Like, let's talk about that. Like, and how come that's not on your resume? Because that, that kind of stuff is, is the thing that separates you. You know, maybe you like to hike, maybe you like to take pictures, maybe you like, like, whatever it is, like, give yourself uh, some personality. And this is where, this is where that comes in, the 30, the 30, 70, 30 rule.
How are we doing on time? We have till, Nina, we have till 12, yeah? Yes, we have until noon. Okay. Okay, great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get done by 1130 so we can get questions, maybe even sooner. Okay. Um, so that's the 7030 rule. Please, please, please apply this because it will, it will make a world of difference when it comes to actually applying. Please, please, for the love of God. Okay. The litmus test. This is the litmus test that I do with all of my students. You give me a resume, you, any student that I interview, uh, whether like official interview, like at USC or wherever. Um, the litmus test is this. I take your resume and I put my finger, regardless of where it's at, it can be a leadership experience, it can be a volunteer experience, it can be whatever. And I put my finger on that experience and you should be able to like, in a second, you should be able to give, you should be able to tell a story tell a vivid story that was meaningful to you, okay? If you can do these three things, the first is tell the story, tell a, a vivid story. Um, from that story, what lesson did you learn? Like, did you learn teamwork? Did you learn how to listen? Did you learn how to be a better leader? Did you learn um, grit? Did you learn resilience? Did you learn time management, prioritization? What, you know, overcoming procrastination, whatever it is, you learned a lesson. And it's like directly tied. They can't be like, like I had some students like tell me it's like a story, but the lesson didn't really like tie with the story. I'm like, how did you learn that lesson? Like, I didn't even, I didn't even pull that from that story. It doesn't even make, it doesn't really make sense. So be, be genuine about it, right? You told the story, you learned a lesson and then you learn like you then after telling the story, taking the lesson, how are you gonna apply that as a student in their program? and an alumni as a provider, okay? So if it's grit or if it's um, learning how to be a team player, how are you gonna apply that lesson as a student when you're working with students to, to study for an exam or you're struggling or you see a, you see a, a classmate struggling or you see a, um, a fellow colleague in your practice struggling? How are you gonna, how, how is the lesson that you learned through this story, through this experience going to make you a better student and a better provider. And if you can do those, if you can do those three things, if you can do those three things with multiple stories for any given experience, I promise you, like, like I promise you, you will never slip up during a, during an interview. This is like, this is like your bread and butter. You should have multiple stories for any given experience. Um, and you always think in the head, in, in your head is like, Oh, it's that the litmus test. And, and if you can't do that with an experience, if you're like, oh yeah, but I was like, that was like so many years ago and I can't really remember anything. Trust me, don't put it on there because you're just not gonna, you're just not gonna, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't serve a purpose. Because if somebody asks you about it, then you're gonna trip up and you're gonna, and you're gonna look like a fool. And don't, so don't do it. Um, but I promise you, if you think hard enough, you can find it, you can find a story, you can find a lesson, you can find ways to actually contribute through that lesson as a student and as a, as a, as an alumni of their program. And they want to know those things. Okay. All right. So litmus test. Okay. Those are like big, big topics, big, like umbrella things that I think every student should know the pillars, how to stand out the X factors, the 70, 30 rule, the litmus test, all these things. Um, I guess, you know, I was going to wait until the end for questions, but I think we can, uh, you guys, you guys tell me, do you guys want to go into cases? We have two cases. I have a family medicine case and a street medicine case. Um, and for those that have some type of exposure to, to medicine may enjoy this, but do you guys want to do questions now? or you guys want to save for questions to the end? please put in the chat, which I can't currently get to. Oh, here we go. Okay, we have one vote for going to cases. Yeah, it looks like cases yeah, first. Cases. <laughs> cases, let's do it. Okay, great. All right, I'm just gonna go, let's, let's go, because I don't wanna waste your guys' time. Let's, let me pull this up. Let's do this. Close this. All 
All right. Whoa, how do I go back? There we go. Okay. All right. First case. This is a 37 year old female with past medical history of high blood pressure, hypertension. That is the abbreviation for high blood pressure. Dizziness for three days. Look how dizzy she looks. She looks, she looks miserable. Okay. So dizziness, dizziness is probably like the one, like um, one of the scariest, I think, uh, and ultra level of consensus. Uh, it's one of the scariest things for students, uh, for like clinical students. I have medical students and, and PA students that round with me all the time. Um, and this is like, when they see dizziness, it's like deer in the headlights. So we're going to try to go through, going to try to go through this. Okay, the signs and symptoms. She says, uh, for those who, who don't know, uh, for any HPI, we go through uh, what's called uh, OPQRST, OPQRST, which is onset, provocation, uh, quality, severity, um, and then when does it actually happen? So there is no inciting event. Nothing makes it better or worse for her, for her dizziness. She doesn't take any medication, no medications, not for the, not for the actual dizziness. She does take her lisinopril, which is for her, her high blood pressure. She has no known family history. Um, she doesn't smoke, she doesn't drink, no substance use. She reports fatigue, lightheadedness, weight loss, but she denies fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, chest pain, palpitations, shortness of breath, vaginal bleeding. Um, and you'll, you'll see why all of these, so all of these are, when it says reports and it says denies, these are our things that, that we think about because we're trying to rule things out in our head. So we're going to ask these types of questions because these symptoms, these symptoms are tied usually to a specific diagnosis that we want to know, like, hey, if this person has, you know, uh, palpitations, then they might have this that's causing their dizziness, if that makes sense. Um, their, her last menstrual period was two weeks ago, and she denies any depression, anxiety, and other psych history. So you can think like, this is a pretty hard, this is a pretty hard case because the, 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 uh, the beauty of an HPI, which is your, your the history of the present illness, whatever they're, they're complaining about, this is their take on it. And so you're asking questions to, to try to get clues. Every, I tell, I tell this to my students, every, every diagnosis is a mystery. And you're just trying to get as many clues as you possibly can to get to the, to solve this mystery, to solve this, you know, you get all these clues to solve this mystery, right? So if you're not asking these questions, you're not getting the clues and chances are you're not going to solve the mystery. But we already asked all these questions and we didn't get much other than that she feels fatigue, lightheadedness, which is basically, you know, kind of like syncope, like they feel like they're going to pass out uh, and weight loss. That's literally all we got. Everything else was negative. No, no family history, no smoking, no alcohol use. Seems like a normal menstrual period, no depression, no anxiety, no medications that might cause this dizziness. So we go on to, after the signs and symptoms, we wanna go and get an actual physical. We wanna learn like, you know, see if we can see anything. So the physical exam, her blood pressure is 110 over 76. Her heart rate 76, her respiratory rate 16, O2 is 98, uh, temperature is 98.7. Does anybody see, we're going to do like, let's do interaction at this, at this stage. Cause I feel like, you know, we could still get through in about 15 minutes and still get uh, time. Does, does anybody see anything wrong with these vitals for those that, that have been actually exposed to medicine? Does anybody see anything wrong with these vitals? Uh, everything seems pretty normal. The Systolic blood pressure is a little bit low. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yes. I'll tell you a trick. They just came out with a, a study that says if their systolic blood pressure is low and they're asymptomatic, then it doesn't really matter how low their, their systolic blood pressure is. There are people that sit at 96, at 98, at 102, at 106, or whatever, at, they sit at 110. Um, she's also on blood pressure medication, right? So she could be just at, at um, she just could be at control. Uh, so no, there's nothing, there's nothing really wrong with these, these uh, vitals. These are all pretty normal. Heart rate is generally 60 to 100. Respiratory rate is 12 to 16. Uh, oxygen, oxygen rate is usually above 97. 
Um, and you guys all know temperature. Um, head, head, ears, nose, and throat was normal. Heart rate was regular rate and rhythm. S1, S2 was present, you know, like the two beep, the two systolic, dis, diastolic um, heart, uh, heart sounds. Uh, respiratory, clear to auscultation bilaterally, no reason, no reason, no ronchi, uh, and no coarse breath sounds. Uh, skin was white mucous membrane, skin tinting. So skin tinting gives us a, gives us a clue, and that's a clue of, of dehydration. It's literally, you like put, you, you like literally squeeze the, the skin together and see if it, if it takes a little while to, to, to kind of reform. Um, and if it like goes very slowly, then uh, it's a sign of dehydration. We call that skin tinting. Um, let's see. White mucous membrane. So if you look at their eyelids, you know, under their eyelids, they're, it's generally white. Special test, orthostatic. So we say like, uh, orthostatics is they're, they're laying down, they're sitting down, and then they're standing up. Uh, and we take the blood pressures at those, at those three different, um, you know, where, how the patient is lying. And if there's a change, a drastic change in blood pressure, it means that as they're, you know, getting up, they feel their, their change in blood pressure is not oxygenating their brain enough. They don't have their, their blood pressure is not high enough to actually oxygenate their brain. And so they feel, they start to feel dizzy. Um, and that's a very easy diagnosis, super easy diagnosis. Um, point of care glucose, she could be hypoglycemic, she could have low blood sugars. EKG, we didn't do the EKG. I wasn't suspecting anything for the EKG, but we could theoretically do it. Urinalysis, you, there's a lot of, lot of patients that come in with dizziness and, and they're, they're a little altered um, just from a UTI. Uh, and that's just an abnormal uh, urinalysis. That was normal. And then um, because she's a female and she's still at um, childbearing age, we always want to do a pregnancy test, and that was negative. There's something missing here. Does anybody know? What could cause, like, fatigue generally? I'm sure many, several of you have experienced this. What is missing? You guys can put in the chat if you guys don't. If you guys don't want to talk, I prefer you guys chat, talk. We have a couple responses. We have uh, mono, menopause, anemia, menstrual cycle, anemia again. Menopause, yeah. Hello, okay. Come on, Maybe hypoglycemia, the, the sugars were normal, CMP potentially, electrolytes were normal, neuro exam was normal, stress, uh, she, she denied depression, anxiety. Menopause, her last, men, her last menstrual period was normal two weeks ago. Mono, uh, we wouldn't really know unless we did the, we did the uh, blood sample, but we can make a clinical diagnosis by looking in the throat, but the, the OP, head, ears, nose, and throat was normal. Um, anemia is a great Thing. We can we can get a hemoglobin. We can get a point of uh, point of care hemoglobin, um, and and so yeah, that's the answer. The answer is the answer is anemia. Um, so you get a hemoglobin, right? Um, and you just see where the hemoglobin's at. And for normal for women, depends on what study you look at, what measurements you look at. But it's generally between twelve and sixteen. Um, so we, so we did a, uh, hemoglobin. Her hemoglobin was 6.4, I believe 6.4. And we generally do it twice. We generally do it twice, but in terms of the treatment for this dizziness, in terms of this treatment of the dizziness, I always, you can put this down for those that are going into medicine. Maybe you're, maybe you're close. Women PE, uh, and this will guide your treatment. Women PE, dub, the W is, is actually two Vs, it's vasovagal. Um, so this is a differential diagnosis. This will give you a differential diagnosis for, for dizziness. W is vasovagal, uh, like when you get scared or you strain, people kind of pass out. Um, and this is also for syncope, you know, like if you have a syncopal episode. Um, Ortho, o is for orthostatics, M is for mechanical, so like heart, heart you know, aortic stenosis, um, LVH, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, things that are mechanically wrong with the heart. A is arrhythmia, A is arrhythmia. Um, N is neuro, I saw somebody said a neuro test. Neuro is super, super rare, super, super rare. 
um, probably the rarest within this differential because eventually you'd probably want to get a, an MRI of the brain. I actually diagnosed somebody with, um, he came in with dizziness and, 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 and he was like passing out, like as I was talking to him in between and he would like regain full consciousness. Um, but eventually we got an MRI of his brain and he had um, uh, paraventricular calcifications with toxoplasm toxoplasmosis. He was from Venezuela. Um, but anyway, uh, neuro and his neural P is, uh, P is psych. So like if they're, they have like depression and anxiety, those psych can cause anything. E is electrolytes. So somebody said like a CMP, good. It's a good thought. You can have hypo, you know, high, high, uh, sodium, low sodium. Um, what's not on here is anemia. Uh, and I guess we can tie that into electrolytes, um, of some sort. Uh, we generally start conservatively. You want to increase fluids. You can put, you know, you can do maneuvers to decrease dizziness. One thing that's not on this differential is vertigo. Um, people will classify dizziness and vertigo. It's a little, uh, you have to kind of specify, is it vertigo or is it, um, uh, syncope? Is it lightheadedness? She said lightheadedness. So we were kind of going with that. Um, but it could be BPPV, which people are like, you know, the room spinning. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have, have felt that. Avoid the triggers, so basal bagel. If you strain a lot, avoid that. Um, remove offending agent. This is like medications, you know, don't, don't, let's not mess with the medications that are actually causing um, dizziness. And there are plenty, there are plenty of them. Um, medications, uh, meclizine is like basically a Band-Aid. It helps with dizziness. Um, this is like the Dramamine kind of, kind of deal. Um, and it helps, it does help. Rate control, if there was an arrhythmia, remember we talked about there's, you know, in women P, you can have an arrhythmia, you can do a beta blocker, you can do something to, to decrease the heart rate. You can give them what they lost. So somebody said CMP, if you saw low, low, uh, if you saw high sodium or low sodium, you would give them more sodium or you, or you would deplete the sodium. Or if you saw low potassium, you would give them potassium. If we saw, um, uh, like this next one, blood transfusion. If the anemia was so low, then we want to do a blood transfusion. We want to give them what they give them what they lost. It's very, very straightforward. Okay. Oh, it's five point five. The second one is five point five. Um, the differential includes severe anemia. Usually, the differential is like a long list of uh, a differential. Um, but the the hemoglobin was so low that she could have lost her life within the next hour or so, and so. We, uh, as soon as I got the hemoglobin, I already knew I was going to send her to the ER. Then I was going to do a follow up from the ER. So I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything from that point on other than getting her back for the, for the ER so I can do more labs because the ER was going to do more labs, was going to do labs anyway. I wouldn't get labs even poke her twice for no, for no reason. So, um, oh, this is a pop quiz. When do we seek transfusion? At what number? You can put it in the chat. What number would we seek transfusion? And it's generally below, right? Because normal was 12 to 16. So below what number do we seek transfusion? In the chat. Where am I at? What is this chat? So someone said 8, 10, 12, Seven. Five, seven. Ten. Yes. Yes, seven. It's seven. Aaron's. Yes, seven. Um, teetering on, you know, teetering on seven, maybe seven, a little more than seven. Um, but anything below seven, we, we, we treat, we treat, um, we, we don't treat Well, we give, we give blood transfusion. We give a blood transfusion. You can only do that in the ER. So if you're in a clinic and if somebody has a hemoglobin below seven, you want to make sure that they go to the ER. You don't want to risk that because, uh, you just never know what can happen. So urgent referral to the ER for further evaluation. At the ER follow-up in three days, I ordered a point of care glucose. It was normal. The orthostatics, again, were normal. The, the blood pressure, different blood pressures. The hemoglobin was 8.5, so it was okay. I didn't have to send it to the ER at that time. Um, the iron studies, I get iron studies because most common, uh, most common anemia is iron deficiency anemia. CBC with manual differential. Uh, CM, so CBC is going to, you know, look at red blood cells, white blood cells, and you know, all the different types of white blood cells. CMP is going to check for kidney function, generally, um, in some liver and liver function. LFT is liver function, liver function test is what it stands for. UA is a urinalysis, so it's checking urine, UTI. 
and then an HCG. HCG is pregnancy test uh, with follow up in one week. I don't know why I did a. Well, I don't know why I did that, but whatever. Uh, so CVC with manual differential show low platelets congruent with the ER labs. So I said like this thing was low. The platelets were low. So one, so two cell lines were low, the red blood cells, which is the hemoglobin and the platelets were, were consistently low. So I was like, man, this is, this is not right. And then she came back two weeks later and her hemoglobin was again, like, like 5.2 or something. And I was like, oh, I have to send her to the ER again. The ER did, did their, their workup again. Platelets were low. The red blood cells were low. I was like, this is not normal. And generally if the ER has a suspicion, they'll tell the, the primary care to say, Hey, we think this patient needs this and they didn't say anything. Um, and I was like, dude, this is, this is not okay. So I sent her to uh, hematology oncology because I'm thinking like weight loss is always uh, a bad sign. If you have it, a, if you have any inkling of cancer, weight loss is always a bad sign. Um, and so I sent her to, um, to hematology oncology. And like I said, this is, uh, the repeat CBC showed low platelets. I remember weight loss referred to hematology oncology. Patient received a bone biopsy and the bone biopsy came back with leukemia. She received chemotherapy that following week. We had to jump through a bunch of insurance hoops to get this done. And I saw her a few weeks ago and she's doing, she's doing good. And um, we essentially, you know, you know, leukemia has a, has a good survival rate, but we, we essentially saved, saved her life. You know, it was really, it was, something special. Um, and I had something, I had something on, uh, leukemia, but I don't want to drag this along. Um, but it's, it's essentially malformation of a, of a specific cell line, generally white blood cells, um, at the level of the bone, because the bone is the, produ is the production is like the powerhouse for mo the majority of your cells, um, red blood cells and white blood cells included. And so that's why they go and do a bone biopsy because they want to go see these cells. Um, and these here, this, this little depiction, um, these, this granulation of, of uh, purple within these cells are called R rods, R rods, A-U-E-R rods. Um, and that's consistent with uh, a specific type of leukemia, specifically uh, acute myeloid leukemia. Okay. But we got her treatment. We got her treatment, and she's and she's doing better. Hey Tony, um, what's you, up? Do you know what caused the weight loss, or do you like, know as to why she most likely? Was? Yeah, I mean, most likely, most likely the cancer. Most likely the cancer. Um, from like uh, malnutrition, right? Because cancer is can all cancer is is an over proliferation of cells. White blood cells, you know, if you look at a, if you look at a, a petri dish of, um, or like a, a specimen, that's why I did the CBC with differentials. You look at the, they actually look at the cells. And if you look a little specimen of cells, you'll see like majority of red blood cells in a normal um, sample. You see majority of red blood cells and maybe like two or three white blood cells, right? Because white blood cells um, destroy tissue, um, right? That's the, that's the whole idea of like, um, the inflammatory response is, is only good to a, to a degree because it's actually like your body attacking itself to, to get rid of the bacteria and hopefully it gets rid of the bacteria or whatever it is that it's, that it's fighting against. But if you look at a leukemia um, slide, um, a, a, just, a, just a sample, you'll see like the majority or at least half of like white blood cells. And so it's essentially the over proliferation of the white blood cells is essentially eating away at, at the body. Yeah. So, and leukemia is bad because it's, it's at the, it's at the basis of the cell line. It's at the basis of the cell line, meaning, um, as soon as you produce the blood, the, 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 the white blood cells have been, have been dispersed throughout, throughout the body. So leukemia, you know, you look at like the staging of leukemia and the staging of like, um, Hodgkin's and all these things, um, like lymphoma is because it's widespread, like is regionally, is it, is it um, generalized because, you know, your bloodstream is going to be going everywhere as opposed to being, having an, a specific over proliferation of you uter uh, at the uterus, right? You can control that. But if it starts at the bone, like leukemia, that's why it's like, uh, 
we need we need to get the bone biopsy. We need to do a bone bone transfusion, and, and you know, there's so much stuff. But um, and they do and they do full blast chemotherapy to to, to kind of calm down the uh, the body. Yeah. But but uh, weight weight loss, yes, weight loss is is um, is always concerning in a in significant weight loss is, is always concerning in a in a patient that you're suspecting cancer. Okay. Um, so this is my work on the streets. I see many, many patients on the streets. We have not been prescribing medications because we need medical malpractice to, uh, to do that, which we're in the process of doing so. Um, but we do like both my, myself and, and my medical director, MK, Dr. MK Orslak, um, we actually do like, uh, you know, evaluate patients and see patients on the streets. Um, with our students, you know, there's a lot of liability. So we, we've kind of just stuck to building relationships and so on and so forth. Um, I have, oh, oh my gosh. Okay. I'm going to call it 1140. Okay. Six minutes, guys. Uh, a 42 year old uh, Caucasian male with past medical history of high, hypertension, high blood pressure, right? Bipolar and substance use disorder uh, presents with dependent edema. Uh, so leg swelling times two months. Uh, he's relatively young, uh, 42. Uh, he has, and we'll go into his history here. Look how cute this little puppy is, so cute. Um, signs and symptoms, HPI, I kind of broke this one up for you guys. HPI is no inciting event. It's better when his legs are elevated. It's worse in the morning, but has to walk to make a living. Uh, no, no pain, uh, has, has not tried any medications. Uh, and then we did the review of systems down here. You can either include the review of systems at the end of your HPI, or you can include it as a whole different test, um, but, but that's okay. Um, past medical history is no hospitalizations. We, we, we talked about he has high blood pressure, bipolar, and, um, and the substance use disorder, but he hasn't had any hospitalizations, no surgeries, no al allergies are unknown. We know that he takes risperidone, which is for uh, uh, bipolar and, and a few other diseases. Um, or conditions. Lisinopril for his blood pressure. Uh, last be unknown because he hates going to the, um, the doctor's office. Uh, his family history, he knew that uh, his, he has some type of psych disorder in his family uh, and alcohol use. His, his dad passed away of cirrhosis at, at 45. Um, he's currently unemployed. He lives out of his car. He recycles to make a living, which is a huge, um, it's a very common thing. 20 pack year smoking history, occasional alcohol use, 10 years of methamphetamine use, last used one week ago, uh, reports fatigue, shortness of breath with exertion, difficulty sleeping. So this is in association to his, his uh, dependent edema. And there are a few other uh, like orthopnea, is he like, is he having, uh, does he have to, does he have to sleep with pillows to, to be able to breathe? Those, there's other things I could have included in here. Um, that would that would lead me toward the diagnosis, but I didn't want to give it away. Um, denies fever, chills, no nausea, no vomiting, no diarrhea, no headache, no chest pain, no palpitations, no shortness of breath at the moment. He has no shortness of breath at the moment because he does have shortness of breath um, on exertion, if we remember, which says somewhere here. Anyway, um, let's see. Per patient, he has no depression, no anxiety. For, for a comprehensive history, I'd actually use housed beds. This is like a process of how we get a history from homeless, from the unhoused, um, living outside. It's like, what resources do they use? How often are they at their, at their place? Um, who's doing outreach with them? You know, what's their diet like? Do they, how do they make their money? There's a bunch of different things and, and I'll, I'll provide that resource at the end. Physical exam, his blood pressure is 162 over 92, 70, high rate 76, respiratory rate 16, O2 is 98%, temperature is 98.7, uh, HENT, JVD, otherwise normal. What's JVD? Does anybody know? Just say, say it out if we can, does anybody know? Jugular vein distension. Jugular vein is what? Distension. Yeah, jugular vein is the same. Distension, yes, 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 yes. Jugular vein is distension, which is pretty, is pretty obvious when he's lying down. Um, he has a displaced PMI. Um, point of maximal impulse is generally at the axial line, or sorry, at the mid-axial line. 
So like in between your clavicle and, and the, like the midpoint between your clavicle, your sternum and your, and your chromium process, it's here. And then essentially when you put your stethoscope there, you hear the, the heart the loudest. If it's displaced, meaning that it's more to the left or it's more to the right, you know that there's some sort of structural disease, um, generally, generally speaking. So that would, that would, that would, um, that along with another, you know, a few other things in the history would, would push me to get an EKG um, and, and see like where his heart's at. Like understand how his heart's doing. Uh, respiratory rate, clear auscultation, his lungs look good. Skin, he has abrasions across his PIP joints, which are the proximal interphalangeal joints, not the distal interphalangeal joints. Okay, these are proximal interphalangeal. So he has scarring here because he's He's a, he's a, he uses substance use. He ran out of veins on his arms. Um, so he shoots in between his, his um, knuckles. Um, the, these are as proximal. So he has, he has some, uh, I believe bilaterally, he has some scarring tracking on the left arm, um, which are like, you know, lines that you see. Uh, extremities, significant uh, dependent pitting edema. This is pitting edema. You push your you push your finger into the skin and it stays. It's like, a, it's like that, you know, um, that's called pitting edema. Uh, with minimal venous stasis, venous stasis, like you see the people with like discolored legs and, and you see like the blood pooling there. That's venous stasis generally. Um, and there's other things that it could be, but just to kind of make it somewhat uh, visual and vivid for you guys. Warm, it's warm without tennis palpation, which is important. Pulses are present, but diminished. Range of, motion, range of motion is normal. Reflex is normal. Sensation is intact. Special test, negative Hohmann sign, which is ruling out a uh, uh, DBT. You essentially push against the heel. Uh, you, push, you push the uh, into dorsiflexion, the, the foot into dorsiflexion and see if the, if the patient has a uh, calf pain. The, the idea is you want to rule out the peat of uh, a DBT um, because if they have calf pain, if they have a redness there, you want to rule out a DVT, but she, the, the patient had none of that. Um, okay, we did the EKG. This is, you can see the EKG is kind of jumping off the charts. It turned out he had uh, LVH on the, on the EKG. So we started conservatively, we elevated the legs, changed sleeping positions. These are things that we want to think about when we're doing uh, street medicine. A low salt diet, which keeps their, keeps their, um, uh, their blood pressure generally lower, remove the fun offending agent, medicine, substance use, he smokes, right? All of those things. And then medications, what do we want to do? For Osamide, the water pill is kind of hard because he lives outside. So he's going to have to go, go urinate all the time, but he's living outside. So how do we navigate that? Beta blocker, we can't do a beta blocker because it could be rebound tachycardia and we could, we could essentially um, kill the guy if we give him a beta blocker because he has meth use. And anybody with meth use can have is more increased risk for uh, beta blocker uh, rebound tachycardia. Hydrochlorothiazide, kind of the same thing as a water pill. Spironolactone, uh, relatively the same thing. We did the chest X-ray, chest X-ray, EKG, echo, and ideally he'd get get a cardiology consult. Um, you can see this is like uh, jumped off the charts. You see these like big lines right here. This is LVH. This is LVH. It's working too hard. Assessment plan, all roads point to congestive heart failure. And then my, my doc always have in the back of my head that I work with, Dr. A, he's a medical director at, at a community care. Like, but, but that's just a sign. That's not a diagnosis. You need to actually get the diagnosis. Is it diabetes? Is it cholesterol? Is it high blood pressure? What is it? Um, the echo showed cardiomyopathy with reduced ejection fraction, and it's consistent with meth-induced cardiomyopathy. They can get a big heart from, from um, taking so much meth. Um, and that's essentially what he had. It was really sad because he actually, uh, he, he got out, we got him in his, our substance use dis, uh, or disorder program, our MAP program, and he was in Project Room Key. Um, he, at the follow-up, he had like mildly high white blood cells. So we got a repeat x-ray and he had a really bad pneumonia. Um, we suspected that it was, that it was um, possibly due to COVID and I, uh, he passed away, unfortunately, with, with us. And this was, this is not his x-ray, but um, diagnosed with COVID during his ER visits a uh, week, week later, weeks, weeks later, upgraded to ICU and he ended up passing away from COVID. The average life expectancy of men in the unhoused, uh, 
population is 52 and women is 42. How crazy is that? Like, that's why we're out there doing the work that we do. Um, anyway, these are some recommendations. I want to get to your guys' questions. So I'm going to, I'm going to end this quickly. These are your, my, my recommendations for things that you guys want to do. If you guys are trying to get into medicine, and these are all apps that you want to have on your phone and podcasts and YouTubes and all good stuff um, to look into. The one thing I will say, this is, this is a good, good friend, good mentor of mine, Dr. Dave Atkins, an orthopedic surgeon. He was the former orthopedic surgeon of the, uh, the uh, 49ers and the Raiders. Um, we did pediatric orthopedic surgery in Cuenca, Ecuador together. Um, and this is actually in, in Ecuador. Um, after we had done all our surgeries and stuff, we did something for the community. Um, uh, but he just taught me so much stuff. He actually won the humanitarian award winner. I'm going to be, I was, I was so um, honored for him to ask me to go speak on his behalf. Um, we're going to be doing that November 9th or in a few weeks in, in San Francisco. Anyway, here are some of the things that, that I'll leave with you guys. Medicine is not about what you know. It's about what you don't know. It's essentially like you're always learning, always continually growing. Everybody should always continually learn. There's, there's never enough to know. Never, you never know everything. You never know enough. Um, and your patients need you. Um, one thing Dr. Ackerman would always tell me is like, the patient is the universe. Whatever it is that you're doing, like ultimately it's on the patient. The patient, the patient is the universe. How do you become an, a leader in the community? I, I always tell people, if you feel a need consistently with an open heart and the humility to learn, again, that whole process of understanding what you don't know, uh, you learn in the process, you will always win in the end. And the idea there is consistently and with humility and you're giving a need in your community. Um, and it's huge, huge, huge. And you'll become a leader. Um, how to find me. This is my email. Please use it wisely. Um, this is my social media. This is my personal, uh, this is my personal. So, uh, I, Instagram, Anthony underscore Minacho, uh, Sacramento street med is at Sac street med and Brainbox methods for students are actually looking to have a platform and a resource to actually be successful and make sure that you get in um, to the school of your choice and that you're choosing where you want to go rather than just saying like, I'll go wherever they take me. Um, that's Brainbox Methods at Brainbox Methods. Um, but with that, I want to open it for questions, guys. I know it's only 15 minutes. I will stay five minutes after. So I'll make it 20 minutes, um, maybe 10 minutes after because I feel bad. Okay. As long as, um, as, long as the people will let me. All right, there's a question in the chat. Did you go straight to PA school after undergrad? No, I didn't. I actually, I took, uh, I took a few, um, I took a few gap years. Oh, I, I don't know a few gap years. So I, I did so much stuff, man. I graduated, when I graduated, I went to, I, I worked in the state capitol. Uh, I moved to Sacramento. I worked in the state capitol eight to five. I, I worked on the ambulance six to, to 10, sometimes six to midnight, because you never know. Um, that was, that was for about a year, year and a half. And then I, and then I, um, got a job in SoCal, which was crazy. I worked in the ER and I stacked my schedule, um, because I, I needed more time with my daughter. And so I stacked my schedule to work six nights straight in the ER at St. Bernardine's for those that are familiar with SoCal. Uh, I worked at St. Bernardine's for, uh, six nights straight as an ER tech. I did that for a year straight up until I went to, to USC. I wasn't going to go until they offered me that scholarship. Um, and I was like, dude, because I was getting so close. I was getting so, so much quality time with my daughter. And they're like, okay, well, you, you know, you just got this scholarship literally days before matriculation. And, um, and I made it happen then. So, yeah. Another question is GRE is not required anymore for PA school. Do you think it would still be good to take it? Uh, if it's not required, don't worry about it. I, I, I don't think that's true though. I think they take, I think many programs do take GRE um, or do require a standardized test, whether that's the GRE or, or um, the PA cat, I think is what it is. Um, but, but yeah, I mean the GRE, the GRE and the PA cat and all those standardized tests for PA school um, for me personally, that I've seen and that I've, I've been working with a lot, many, many, many students um, that, uh, yeah, they don't have, they don't, they, should I say, 
they don't put as much preference or uh, weight on standardized tests as, as say medical school. And I should say for those students that are those those students that are are um, look that are on the verge of getting in getting a, 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 a like a job or getting an interview to a school or what have you I'm going to be doing an interview uh, how to ace your interview uh, workshop this Sunday at 7:30 the zoom the zoom link is at that that brainbox methods um, anybody can go it's obviously free I do that we do workshops every other weekend. And um, trust me, you're gonna want to you're gonna want to join in if you're actually gonna be doing an interview because I've done many 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 mock interviews and real interviews that I'm just like somebody should have just told you not to like say that or do this or you have such a great story like this is how you should be doing it. So that's, um, that's this Sunday. That's this Sunday at seven thirty. Yes, go ahead. There's a question in the chat. Um, how did you handle the stress of the preceptors testing you and asking you a bunch of questions nonstop during rotation? And how did you handle the stress of not having the answers to all of it? Um, one is like being very structured and very studied. Um, I always tell students like all the time, like have your have your have your presentation skills like on point because once you have your presentation skills on point and this is what dr akin had always showed me once you have your presentation skills on point and you just go through it like like a like a like a damn not to say a robot you can do it passionately but like you know the thing like it's like it's the back of your like it's the back of your head you know if a if a preceptor says hey what about that patient oh it's a 37 year old female with past medical history of hypertension presenting today for dizziness times three days she says, you know, there's no, no inciting event. Nothing makes it better or worse. No medication. She, she denies any pain. She denies fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, no headache, no this, yada, no that, but no medication, no surgeries, no, no hospitalizations. She says that yada, yada, yada. The physical exam shows this, this, and this. I believe we should be doing this. I think that it's orthostatic hypertension. We, uh, orthostatic hypertension, I believe that we should increase fluids, period. Like, if you have that, and I had that when I was a student. So if you could do that, preceptors are more likely to trust you and be able to say like, Hey man, this guy like knows what the hell he's doing. Even if he's wrong, you know, if he's wrong, like, and you have a discussion, you do you never go back and say like, yeah, but I thought yada, yada, yada. you like, you just say, I understand. I, I, you know, I understand like you will, you will be wrong. And, and if you really don't know, like, don't fumble, don't, don't like fumble around. Like, yeah, I have this resident here. He drives me freaking crazy. Resident at my at my at my work. Uh, he's a and he's a third year. I think he's a third year resident. But he's like every single time it comes down to an assessment plan, it's like, yeah, well, I think he should. I think he has like orthostatics and like we got the hemoglobin, but then he's like not. Nah. But so then I really think like we maybe we could do a CBC and then like I like I think we could just do mex meclizine. What do you think? And then my precept, like my, my, the doc that I work with, Dr. A, he's like, it's not my plan. Like, what do you think? You know, it's like, no, dude, like just say, I believe it's orthostatic hypertension. His blood pressure was a change of, of systolic blood pressure by 20. I want to start meclizine by treating symptomatically and follow up in two weeks and repeat high, you know, repeat blood pressures, period. That's it. You know, and then they can say, oh, you know, no, actually you should be thinking about this and this. Um, but you do need tough skin because some preceptors are harder than others. But I promise you that alone, that skill alone um, works miracles. And it makes your life so wonderful and easier as a student because you have it just prepared. Like you just have it like on a gun, like, a, like on a spring, it's so easy. And I can um, tease that. Please. Sorry. Did you feel Sorry, prepared God. for work straight out of graduating, or did you feel like you learned more on the job? Um, I felt. I mean, I felt pretty prepared, which like drives my medical director like freaking insane because like I didn't ask any like that many questions. Though I definitely could have asked many more questions. Um, 
I had some like, I knew I wanted to go to family medicine. That's why I went PA. I had multiple scholarships to go to medical school, but I knew I wanted to go into family medicine. Um, and so I went PA because like, just as a testament to what, where I work, I have my own team. I have a panel of 200 patients. I, you know, like see my own patients. I do, I do my own thing. I ask when I, when I have questions, they ask when they have questions. And, um, but, uh, during my, during my rotations, then like I set up my rotations, like my electives to be in family medicine. In fact, I did my, my elective rotation here where I work today. Uh, and they hired me, but, um, the, uh, the, the trick is like, I, I, I felt like I prepared myself well within family medicine. Um, but with that said, like, there's so much stuff in family medicine, like the amount of diagnoses and things that you have to be conscientious of and aware of, um, is like endless in family medicine. So I felt prepared mentally and physically and ready to go. Um, but like, I'm always learning. I, I spend at least two hours a day studying, you know, still. So on top of everything that I do. Um, does it look bad to have a huge gap in between undergraduate to when officially applying? Not if, not, not if you're doing some badass stuff, man. Not if you're doing like, like some amazing stuff. Um, if you are if you are uh, doing some amazing internships, getting some amazing experience, doing all these incredible things, like take as much time as you need, not crazy amount of time because courses expire, but like, um, trust me, like you'll, you'll be a much better person and whole holistic uh, provider because of it and student because of it. Um, what are your thoughts and advice going about retaking science classes at a CC? At a UC or CCs? Community college? Community college. I personally, like, I personally, um, I personally don't care, to be honest. Like, if you have the grades, um, and I guess it depends, it depends on the school that you're going to, because like if I, I, we have a few students um, going to Stanford and like, you know, if you're talking about like Stanford or like maybe UCLA, or, it depends on, your, on, the, on the student schools, right? Um, they, might, they might be like, um, like look at your courses in a, in a certain way. But I always say like, hey man, if you show that you can, you can handle a, uh, your, a sci you know, science courses, and you're a stellar person, like outside of the classroom, you want to make it so you want to make it so that they're like looking for you. Like they want you. Um, and that doesn't come with like a biology class, you know, that doesn't come with like a microbial class that comes with like, holy shit, this guy, I mean, sorry, I, this guy's leading this thing in the community and he's making a change and he's a leader and he loves to, he works with people. He knows this person, like we've met him. He's, he's an amazing person. Like, oh yeah, he took micro, but he got like, he did well. And like, he can handle the, he can handle the coursework, you know? Like I, yeah. Other than virtual shadowing, do you have any recommendation as to what we can do during the pandemic to help progress our applications? Oh my gosh. That's like, a, that's like a loaded question, man. Um, so much, dude, so much. There's so much, like, there's so much unrest. There's so, there's so many needs to be filled within your communities, regardless of where you are. There's people here all from all over the country. Um, but literally there are needs within your community that you can fill, um, and that's a public health, generally, generally they are public health initiatives. Um, you can do that. That, that. that says so much more than anything you can possibly do. Internships are still taking applications. Um, you can still volunteer. If you're asking about shadowing opportunities, you can literally go to any clinic and do the same thing that you've done before that, that we recommend before, which is, you know, you get your resume, you get a good little elevator pitch. It doesn't have to be crazy. 
um, and then ask to, if, if, if you can shadow for a few shifts or a shift um, and, and like, like very, I'm mean, telling you very few people do that. Um, but those that do tend to tend to, you know, fare better than those that don't. Um, would you recommend someone getting a master's degree in something science related before applying to PA school or just going straight after undergrad? Uh, it depends on your passions, man. Like I had like, again, like I, I'm like, I'm more interested in like who you are as a person and who, who like what experiences you've developed and how that's, how that's developed you as a person then then you starting school or doing this or doing that so if you feel like you have a passion you want to do this you know uh master's program um outside of the fact that you don't have the grades right because you feel like you have to do a master's because you don't have the grades or you like are unsure but if it's for the sole purpose of like is a master's good you know to have um the majority of people don't have a master's that go into pa school um, a lot of people would have masters that go into medical school, but um, my my um, my urge is that you do what you're passionate about and grow as a person in the process. And if a master's is going to do that for you and fulfill that for you um, on route to your you know destination or whatever it is that you want to do, then by all means do it. Um, someone is asking if you could go back to the slide with the apps and websites. I feel like, I think it was the X Factor slide. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, of course. You just take pictures, man. Community initiatives, conduct your own research, do needs assessment, internships. Oh, sorry. I think it was the clinical rotation one. The, it's towards the end. Oh, the oh the uh, the the things that you things that you want like the podcast and stuff. This one. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Up to date. So good. Up to date. Every every doc every PA uses up to date. I use this on the regular the only amount of research that I really do. Um, the Dinosaurus, it looks stupid. It's like this little dinosaur on this app, but I promise you like it saves your ass with like differential diagnoses, like things you don't wanna miss. And like you just put in like abdominal pain and it's like pancreatitis and, and appendicitis and this, do you think about this? Did you think about this? Do you think about this? And then like, if you're a good clinician, like you can look at it and be like, no pancreatitis because triglycerides were normal. The patient doesn't drink. You know, there are no stones. And no, it's not. It's not. You know, appendicitis because the patient doesn't have this. The physical exam was normal. It's not this. It's not nephrolithiasis because yada yada. You know, and you go down the list, but you have a differential on it. Um, it's good to have and make sure you're like your your thought process is is linear. Uh, Hippocrates is everything. Prescriptions. MD Calc is all the type of screening tools and stuff. These are some good YouTubes. Online med is, med ed is badass. Osmosis is pretty simple. Ninja nerd, he goes a little deeper. Uh, podcast curbsiders, they're, they're so badass. Um, PA exam review, the audio pants and pantry. That's for my PA people. For those wanting to work on the streets, Joint Street Medicine Institute. Yeah, that's a, that's a great org. And then Look up Corinne Feldman's piece right there. All righty. Um, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, Tony, do you have any last minute advice for our students? No, I would say, you know, just like this, this journey is so, is so brutal. Like, I, I know, like you, there's, there's students for, for that we take on now that are like, older and they want to do this thing and they see just how brutal like this whole thing can be um but understand that like 
my urge to you is to always learn and grow like every single day. And the, like, I'm, I'm like, I'm a huge reader. And one of the people I, I've read up on a lot is Jordan Peterson. And he always, tell, he always talks about this thing of like, um, are you in love? Are you in love with what you know? Because this is the majority of people. Most, the majority of people are in love with what they know. Like they're in love with what they know. They, they'll tell you everything that they know and everything that they did and everything. Yeah. But he, he challenges people to think of the opposite. So it's like, are you in love with what you know or are you in love with what you don't know? Because if you're in love with what you don't know, then you will always, always, always grow. Um, and that is like so, so key in this whole process and know that you're growing throughout this entire process as, as, as an undergrad, um, as a student, as a postgrad, um, as a professional student, and then as a, as a provider, as a professional. Um, I'm continually growing, you know? So that's my, that's my last piece, last piece of advice. Thank you so much, Tony, for spending this time here with us today. Um, for all of my students, please don't forget to go over to the website after you're done taking the quiz and comment on how you found today's talk. Um, talk about anything you learned that was interesting, any nice points that Tony brought up that you think are going to stick with you for the rest of your life. Those are always appreciated and we love to look at those. My next announcement is if you guys are interested in joining the team, um, we are taking applications. This is a volunteer position um, and you can join from anywhere. Um, it's all online and um, yeah, so this can be found on our website. Um, and if you guys would like to be a part of pre-health shadowing but can't find the time to commit, no worries at all. We do have volunteer opportunities. Um, you can work from home, work on your own time at your own schedule for as many or as little hours as you want. This can also be found on our website. And follow us on Instagram. We have a challenge for you today. Um, please go to our Instagram and find Tony's post. Once you see his post, if you can comment his last name letter by letter without being interrupted by another student and get it all in order, you um, are eligible to be picked for the spotlight student of the session. So good luck with that because it's really hard, surprisingly. <laughs> and our spotlight student of the session today is Sarah Hayes, um, who was able to comment Dulai's last name um, for our session yesterday. So congratulations, Sarah. Oh, another announcement with this one. Be sure to um, repost our stories. We post a lot on Instagram, um, not only with pre-health shadowing, but other opportunities that are available for pre-health students. Feel free to share these. Um, social media is a great way to communicate, um, especially during this global pandemic. So just make sure that every pre-health student has the opportunity to see this. Our next shadowing session will be Monday, November 2nd at 4 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. This will be with a registered nurse, Melanie Jade Bouleris. So don't miss out on that one. And thank you again for coming to our shadowing session. If you would like a certificate verifying your hours, don't forget to take the quiz at the end and I will go into detail on the next slide. So to get your certificate, you want to go back into the module that you guys entered in on Tony's profile page on our website and click take this course. Um, you will have 15 minutes to take the quiz uh, once you hit the start button. Please ensure that you click next and not complete once you finish a question. If you click complete, uh, your quiz will be graded and you will fail um, and you only have one retake. Um, if you are done with the quiz and you pass it, you have to go back to the module page and click finish course. If you do not press finish course, you will not get your certificate. Once you press finish course, your certificate will be downloaded um, immediately. You can download it right after you get it or you can always find it in your profile. If you guys have any questions or concerns, feel free to email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com and we will get back to you as soon as we can. This marks the end of our 10th virtual shadowing session. Thank you so much, Tony. And we hope to see you guys all back here next time. Bye everybody. Thank you guys.